I can't believe we're about to say this. I'm so excited. Yeah, me too. Should I do this one? Or you do this one. It's a dream for me to say. Hey everybody! Robert England here! Yeah, we do therapy. <laughs> Tell us about your earliest memory. Well, my father used to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere, newspapers tomorrow. Incredible scoop. Uh, Robert, welcome to Belgium. I'm going to assume it's not your first time here? No, no, it's not. And yesterday, and I'm never going to remember how to pronounce it, but I had a great kind of pilgrimage to a wonderful restaurant, and I think it's an old pharmacy. Uh, it has a name like uh, Quandrecelle, but it's like an old pharmacy. It looks like where Jules Verne went to get his aspirin, you know. It's great, it's kind of industrial, art nouveau. You know, it's, like it's, it's still, pardon? I'm like an apothecary. It's just so amazing, yes, apothecary. Yeah. Yes, that may be what it's called. It may be the Belgian word for apothecary. But it's just a great place. And I used to have lunch there with the late, great Christopher Lee. Oh, oh everything yes. was, And everything was the same. And the menu was the same. You know, I had my filet of soul. I was in, I was in Brussels. And I, if you guys were out yesterday, it was so beautiful. The weather and the little breeze and all the beautiful Belgian girls on their bicycles. Oh, he's still my heart. So yeah, I mean, it's lovely to have you back here and everything else. So, is this your first time being a Comic Con here or have you done a few conventions? Well, I, I've done film festivals and I've done publicity and I've done movies uh, just, just over the channel. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I don't think I've done this one before. I have very dear friends that are involved in this show and they told me about it. And I promised them I would try to come, you know. We are um, very, very thankful you did. This um, is very exciting. Um, actual horror royalty. Well, was, you know what's great is I'm seeing actors that I love, Giancarlo Esposito. You know, I have to tell him again how brilliant he is in Better Call Saul. And he's on Mandalorian now with my buddy Carl Weathers. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, the girls from Charm are here. So I'm, I'm running into people. My son, Vecna, is here <laughs> from Stranger Things. So it's great. You know, sometimes this is the only place we catch up. But we all love coming to Europe. You know, it's such a treat for us. And we all try to put an extra, you know, week or so, so we can go off and, and explore. That's amazing. What's your favorite part of Brussels, that, uh, or Belgium in general? Well, before the movie that made it famous again, I did a, a great uh, personal boat tour of Bruges, Ooh, you know, yeah. when I was younger, and I loved it. And, and uh, I discovered a really, I, if people that know me know I love my wine, and I found a really great Belgian ah, wine. Yeah, so. You're all the reason there's no wine left in the green room. <laughs> That's, it's my next meal. <laughs> no, but, uh, it, but I, I love Brussels too. I mean, I, I, I've had Sundays on the Grand Place or the flower market, and on one of the corners of the Grand Place, there's a, a great pub restaurant, and it, it's almost, when you're inside, you feel like you're one of the three musketeers, you know, waiting for orders from the Queen on Her Majesty's Secret Service. One for all and all for one, and uh, I, I'm going to try to revisit that. But I used to also go to, and I think it was called the Sablon, another square in Brussels, and they had an actor's bar where all the actors, you guys might know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. bar where the actors hang out. And the, no, I don't know this one. I think the theater actors, but maybe the film actors, but the side streets are antique toys. Wow. And they're just amazing. And I also found a great graphic novel store on that street. But I bought two little rich boy 1920s Belgian toy submarines 
for the, you know, like a little rich boy in one of these beautiful homes in Brussels, probably played in his bathtub with, you know. But I, I love old submarines. Yeah. And that's because of the great Belgian writer Jules Verne, the Nautilus from 20,000 leagues under the sea. So the circle remains unbroken. And then next you've got to go to the moon, surely. Yes. 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 I can see I can see you doing that. Just uh, one day turn on the TV and Robert England visits the moon. No, you don't know, we have a comic in America named Bill Nair. And uh, he's always saying, Who wants to go to the moon? He goes, I don't even want to go to Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> you are uh, something that always strikes me about you, you have a very good handle on pop culture. Have you always just loved film and comics and TV and stuff like that? Well, you know what it is? Um, I was a fanboy when I was young. And Wes Craven taught me to respect that and remember that. Because in between, uh, probably, high school and my first movie, I became an incredible artistic snob. Oh, the avant-garde, and I did radical anti-war plays, and I did all the French classics, Moliere, and Ionesco, and I did lots of Shakespeare, and uh, the very modern theater, and I was never going to go back to Hollywood, I was never going to do television. I just went through that phase, you know, I was taking myself too seriously. And uh, when I did Nightmare on Elm Street, Wes Craven taught me to respect the genre, you know, and he said it's a genre, it's just like the cowboy movie, you know, but now, because we trust it, the fans, because we trust all of you, every week there's a great science fiction movie, or a great horror movie, or a great uh, fantasy film, and if not at the movie theaters, there's something new on streaming. I just started uh, The Silo. That's amazing. With the girl, Rebecca Ferguson, from Dune. Oh, by the way, I hear the new Dune is great. That's the talk on the street in, in Hollywood, and it's great. But, I'm, you know, so there's always some really great stuff that you can seek out. You, you mentioned uh, your friend Carl Weathers. Uh, is there anyone else from any other franchises who you're, you've bonded with over the years? Well, I, I, again, I'm a fanboy, so there's people here that I really, I mean, Patty Considine yeah. from Game of Thrones, oh, I love his work. But I love all his work. I love him when he plays bad guys, too. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and obviously my son is here from Stranger Things. Uh, and I, I'm a big, well, I'm a big fan of him. I'm a big fan of his work. But it was nice to see Holly, you know, and uh, I, 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 I run into uh, some of, of the cast of, of uh, Charm before, but uh, I haven't seen Holly in a while, and uh, I think she's living on an island now, but uh, I envy her. But um, yeah, they're fun to come. You never know who you're going to run into the show. My favorite, of course, is the great Lance Henderson is here. Yeah. And you know, you guys all know him from Alien and Terminator and, 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 and uh, uh, Close Encounters and the Third Kind. But Lance has some great, well, he's got a great old cowboy movie that he just did. And he has a movie uh, called Falling, I think, with uh, where he plays Viggo Mortensen's father, Viggo from uh, Lord of the Rings. And it's just a great movie about, uh, you know, a, a, a parent a succumbing to loss of memory and their worst instincts, you know, how to deal with, with that when, when they're aging. But Lance is still, I mean, he's still starring in great, great little movies. I'm doing about one or two a year. I'm doing a lot of voice work now, which is fun. You can show up in your underwear, scratches. <laughs> Just in your pajamas. Because you are a fanboy, what, just curiosity, what's your favorite film of all time? Well, my favorite film changes, you know, uh, and for a while it was East of Eden with James Dean, John Steinbeck, 
And for a while, it was Streetcar Named Desire with Marlon Brando because they're both such terrific actors. I have weird little ones. We were mentioning 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That was really one of those seminal experiences for me as a child, seeing that movie. And right after that, right after I saw the original 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne, I went to Disneyland the second day it opened. Wow. And they had the Nautilus cut in half from the movie because they, they take it apart so they can get the cameras in when they shoot one way. And it had the window, the giant window, like a big eye that opens like a kaleidoscope. And on the other side, you were under the ocean and they had actors dressed up in Art Nouveau antique diving suits walking across the bottom of the ocean floor. Wow. And they had that dappled lighting that happens when the sun is out and shines into water. And they had seaweed slowly blowing. And you kind of got seduced by it. Oh, the seaweed. Oh, the divers are doing an underwater funeral. I remember that scene. And then out of nowhere comes the giant squid with his huge beak. And, and if you couldn't even, if you, if you did the ride maybe three or four times, you could see the wires. Yeah, yeah. And this ride later became the submarine ride at Disneyland. But that was it. So I saw the movie, and a week later, I saw how they did everything. I saw Peter Warry's original costume, and Kirk Douglas's costume, and James Mason's costume. So maybe that's what hooked me, you know? Seeing that behind the scenes thing, you could touch it, you know? This is back when people went to Disneyland, everybody dressed up. Yeah. This is one thing I, I really enjoyed about uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, was the effects that go into it. Like, a lot of the stuff that it's, the tilting of the room and all that sort of thing. Was there anything, obviously, I know that a lot of them, the stunts and that sort of thing. Was there anything that you were involved with that you particularly enjoyed or really opened your mind even more to how films are made? Well, you know, when we began the Elm Street franchise, everything was a practical. Everything's real that you see. Uh, if you've ever seen the first Final Destination movie, that's all real. Those are all stuntmen doing all that stuff. They really did break up an airplane. And they put guys on wires and yanked them out. And it was off the ground and everything was stage. And slowly we got into uh, video assist. And then later on, uh, you know, we got into, we started using a little bit of the new computer generated graphic images. But I think, and I was an old dog, but in Freddy vs. Jason, that's me that comes out of the water. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because I can hold my breath longer. And the stuff I'm, I'm an old surfer. surfer. So I can hold I, I can hold my breath for a long time. And so I did that. That's sort of like my last big stunt ever coming out of the water and landing on the pier. Wow. Yeah. But uh, so I mean I'm kinda of proud of that. And I'm proud of some fight scenes back in my 70s movies. But uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, we always had to joke around because there's always a guy right here dressed all in black, like a puppeteer uh, for the Muppets. And he's right down here. He's got his arm up your leg. You know, and there's tubes <laughs> coming up here to make the chest of souls animate. And you're sitting here, you're trying to act, and you can't cross your leg because you'll hit this guy in the head. You know, it's sort of like we have to stop meeting like this. And now his hands clear on here, you know. So it's funny, it's silly, it's a lot of fun. But you have to get all the jokes out of the way. So that when he's when they say action, you can really get into it and be serious. This, we're going to go out to the audience in a second, so if you have a question, get your hands up and we'll try and get people down to you. Um, yeah, Thomas knows way. Before we get to Thomas, I've read this a few times, I don't know if this is true. Is it true you are the person responsible for making Halloween the Paul Tucker? Making what? I read a thing that you were the guy on the first Halloween film that put the leaves out. Well, no. What? What is this story? My neighbor downstairs was in the art department. 
on Halloween 1. And I had already done a television show, uh, and I played a, a biker, and my girlfriend was Jamie Lee Curtis. She's one of the last contract players uh, at Universal Studios. Wow. She was my chick. And, uh, I, and I, I wasn't working, I was, you know, hanging out, and, you know, waiting here if I got a movie. And my buddy needed help one day. And we went all around our neighborhood and picked up leaves. Oh, wow. And then put them in black garbage bags. And then we drove them over to Pasadena. And they were using them, you know, for the scene with Jamie Lee Curtis walking down the street, or the camera moving the scary, you know, the famous theme from Halloween, the camera would be moving up the street, point of view Michael Myers, you know, and, and leaves would be blowing. Those are my leaves. <laughs> You want to make sure there's no dump or anything in there when you collect them. Otherwise, get I want a residual. <laughs> right, we've got our first question here from a Freddy. Is that good? Absolute pleasure. Um, a question uh, where you were talking about the, the genre in the 80s, very creative times with all the, the um, Halloween Nightmare Option that came out. Um, if you look back at the times, what for you was the absolute best Nightmare Option movie to make and also the most difficult one? The best one was Wes Craven's New Nightmare, number seven, because it was our Valentine to you guys. It was our movie we made for the fans, but it was a little ahead of its time. It was kind of, and you Europeans know these words better than I do, but it was deconstructed, meta, you know, horror, and we was self-referential. Uh, but they took the audiences until Scream 1 came out to understand what we were trying to do, turning a corner in horror, and then Wes Craven's New Nightmare became a belated hit, and it became a huge hit on DVDs. But the best part of that movie was, aside from the fact that we all had money by then, because we were like uh, seven movies into the franchise by that time, and uh, I got to have lunch every day, they had to shoot the little boy in the afternoon. So I was usually done by 11, 12, 1 in the afternoon. I'd take my makeup off, and I'm an actor. I never say no to a free meal. And uh, I would go out where the catering truck was, the food trucks, and get my food, and they'd pour me a glass of wine because I wasn't working anymore. And John Saxon would pull up. And John Sampson and I now had worked three times and been on publicity tours all over the world. And John started telling me stories about Bruce Lee, about James Dean. He starred with Marlon Brando in a movie. He did Robert Redford's first movie, War Hunt. He played a Native American who took scalps from the North Koreans in the no man's land of Korea during uh, the Korean War. And he worked with Clint Eastwood, Joe Hill, Robert Duvall. He worked with Audrey Hepburn and Burt Lancaster and Lillian Gish from the silent movies for John Huston in the Western The Unforgiven. They made him date Natalie Wood. Take Natalie Wood out on dates as when they were the young, beautiful teenagers. He hung out with James Dean. He hung out with Sal Minio. He told me all the stories about the, the end of old Hollywood, because he was on that thing. He even did an episode of CSI directed by Quentin Tarantino. Wow. And, I mean, you know, John Saxon, you know, he knew he hung out with Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. Hey, James Dean, Marlon Brando, oh, and Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Next question, please. Yeah. Came forward. Hi. Um, my question is actually a little bit the same as the previous one, but my question is <laughs> what was your favorite line of scene to film in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street? My favorite lines in Nightmare on Elm Street? Yeah. Well, I made up a line that everybody likes. It used to be something like, oh, Jennifer. 
you know, we finally made it or something like that. She wanted to be a TV actress. She's one of the kids that's having a collective nightmare. And I, I said part of that, but it didn't fit in Freddie's mouth. And in America, one of our regular channels had an advertising campaign called Welcome to Prime Time. And so I just played with that line. And it's sort of a, a fan favorite now. Uh, I love the line in part seven. It's very nasty. But Freddie says to Monica Kina, he says, don't worry, princess. Sometimes the first time gets a little nasty. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, we've got one here, and then we'll get down there and there. Yeah, definitely here. Hello, and thank you for coming to Belgium. Um, I was wondering, because you seem very passionate about you know, the medium of film, and I was wondering if there's a type of character or a type of genre you have not yet played in that you would enjoy, and what? Well, I played a cowboy in a horror movie. But what I did was called Death Trap. Great cast that they had to change that because that's the name of the famous Broadway play. Um, I think Christopher Reeve actually did the movie version, uh, but they called it Eaten Alive, and it's a real Southern Gothic horror movie directed by the director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But it has Oscar-winning actors in it, like Carolyn Jones, Audrey Hepburn's husband, Bel Ferrer, Audrey Hepburn, Hey Belgium. Uh, it had uh, it, 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 a great American character actor, Neville Brand, uh, just a wonderful eccentric cast. One of my favorite horror actors, William Findlay, who's uh, Phantom of the Paradise, The Fury, and my favorite, the best, the best mad doctor of all time, Margot Kidder from Superman in a movie in 1974 directed by Brian De Palma called Sisters. It's about Siamese twins, and Siamese twins freak me out. And he's the doctor that falls in love with one of them. And he's gotta get rid of the other one so he can keep the one he loves. It is a great, creepy 70s movie. And uh, it, it's also one of my favorite horror films. Um, I got lost, what was the, the my... <laughs> Oh, that I haven't done. Well, I've done a Western for Toby Hooper, and uh, I've done science fiction. Uh, I haven't really done pure fantasy. That would be fun. I'm getting old, so I can't... I wanted to play Iago in Shakespeare. I had. I think I had to get a good grip on that. You know, a, a kind of strange racism. And I was going to play Iago as actually loving Desdemona. And that's the real concrete thing. You don't have to play the abstraction of racism. Uh, but I'm too old now. But I understudied Iago with a wonderful actor playing Othello. Great actor who won a Tony Award a couple of years ago. He passed away now. But he did one of those great August Wilson plays. We've got a, another question down here from another Thank you. What Meredith was your favorite My favorite kill? Uh, I, I think, as a, as a member of the audience, I like Tina on the ceiling. But I also love the boy with a hearing aid in part six, because it's so politically incorrect, and Freddie's politically incorrect. So it's very true to the kind of, you know, Freddie's in, in America, he's what we call an equal opportunity killer. <laughs> he doesn't care. He just, he just does it. That's what he thrives on. So well, we're here, here or where? Or yeah, yeah, we can, we can, we're here. We're gonna go and then we, we'll try to get this going with the screen mess. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah, we will get to you, don't worry, because you've been very patient. Did someone over here have Thomas, you get to the screen oh, mess. Okay. Oh, oh, oh screen's got the mic. Yeah. Hello, Robert. Uh, okay, Ghosty Face, what? Uh, my question is, what is your fondest memory with West Green? Wes Craven, I was working for him in Vancouver, Canada, starring in a television series with Jack Coleman from, from uh, uh, 
but, but it saved the cheerleader, it saved the world. I can't think of the name. Heroes. Heroes. Jack Coleman, the great Jack Coleman. And uh, we were watching our our Saturday Live famous comedy show in America called Saturday Night Live. And one of the comics was doing a sketch that you can find it on YouTube called Head Wound Harry. And it's very sick humor, you know, but it's funny, like uh, like Sam Raimi, like Evil Dead funny. And Wes Craven had been drinking a little bit of wine in my apartment with my dog and my wife and Jack Coleman. And Jack Coleman is 6'3", 6'4". Wes Craven was 6'3", 6'4". The two of them were on my couch. There was no other room. They were literally falling off the couch onto the floor laughing at this sketch on Saturday Night Live. And what it was, it was that moment when Wes was no longer my boss. He was no longer the grown-up. He was the friend. You know, and I really cherish that moment. That is so amazing. That's amazing. Uh, we've got a question we've got then. one here, then we'll need to wrap up. So oh, yeah. Hi. 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 So, um, what are the goals for the Fire Fighting Fire Fighting Fire Fighting Fire I'm, I'm what's known as a utility actor, a character actor. Um, I got lucky. I just got very, very lucky. I had V, which was an international success, and Nightmare on Elm Street at the same time. And then Nightmare on Elm Street went on for 20 years. But what happened for me overnight, people knew my face. I'd done 15 movies. I'd starred with Henry Fonda, I've been in movies with Barbara Streisand, starred with Jeff Bridges, uh, uh, lots of people in the 70s. I was always the best friend, the sidekick. People knew my face, but they didn't know my name. Overnight, people know your name, and when you become international, that means I can work here, right? I, and so, I think I've done 15 movies now in Europe, all over the world. And it's just this great advantage, this wonderful thing that happens to a career. And no one tells you about it. Your agent, your manager, your acting teacher, school, they never tell you what it's like when you are discovered in different cultures and different parts of the world. Now you can go work there. And at that, a part of that is that horror and fantasy films and science fiction, they travel, they speak the international language of filmmaking, of movie going. You probably can name 10 of our funniest people in America, and I couldn't tell you 10 of yours, but we know your good movies, we know your action movies from Europe, and we know your special effects movies, and your, and your disaster films from Scandinavia, and your, and your, and your certain things travel but horror, science fiction, fantasy, and action movies travel the best. And I was in two of those, and I began to work overseas as well. And it was just this great, happy accident. I didn't design it, I didn't know about it, I didn't count on it. But I'm, six, I'm 76 years old next week, and I've got two movies coming. And I gotta go back and work, and a documentary. And that would never have happened to me had I not stuck with and been loyal to genre, uh, horror and stuff. Because I aged, I could age into those parts. Now I play the old doctor, the old priest, you know, the old fisherman, the old guy that tells the backstory. Oh, you don't want to go down by the lake, kids. Don't go by the lake. You know, I get to play all those parts now. Or I you know, I'm a priest. Don't sit Well, there was a demonic possession here many years ago. You know, I'm that kind of And I would not have been playing those if I just kept playing the best friends. Because they don't let best friends get old now. They don't get used to. In the 30s and 40s and 50s. You know, John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, all those guys. All those guys had old men that were their sidekicks. But that all changed. So I would not have aged well into those. And it's just a blessing. I took the makeup off, and this old face finally got in front of the camera, and I'm able to play those other parts. You know, every Vincent Price parts. And that's the blessing of, of genre. That's 
was an incredible. Every answer has been incredible. Robert, it has been a delight. We can keep on stage, but you have to let your back out. It's Comic Con. Yeah, Robert, yeah, go go. please, he's here all week at Please go and see him. Go and get signatures, photos, everything like that. But most of all, show your love, show your appreciation. I want you back now. Right, you guys all got it. all got it on tap. Lance Henderson and Holly Holmes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Okay. Um, we will be handing over to the cosplay people now, so if you get the cosplay results.